G'day, welcome back to the Ranty Chair. I just had a call on my mobile phone. Some guy from a call center somewhere in the world, sounded kind of Asian to me. He was gonna sell me a fantastic opportunity. He said, if I invest $100 in their Bitcoin exchange, it will produce $1,200 a week worth of profit. And that's just fantastic, isn't it? I, who would not jump at that opportunity? And I, But just out of curiosity, I asked him, why are you obviously getting paid next to nothing working as a telemarketer for a scam, when if this worked, you could take your pay packet, which must be, what, 500 bucks at least, put it into this scheme, and then retire on the $5,000 a week of income that you'd earn from it. He hung up on me. Perhaps he misunderstood what I was saying, but could that be too good to be true? Hmm. Anyway, that's the kind of crap you get these days on the phone. Computers are making these robot calls so much easier. Um, but oh, I missed out on a stunning deal. Look at that. I'll just have to work for my money now. Damn it. Never mind. Um, what am I talking about today? It is the ranty chair. I am outside because the sun is shining. It's the middle of winter, but apart from a very cold breeze, which is why I am sitting in front of my truck, it is actually quite warm today. And I've got lots of things planned, but I thought I'd get this video out first because something interesting has happened. In the UK, they've announced four, one, two, three, four, yep, four new rules that will be affecting people who fly drones and model aircraft. And two of them come into effect at the end of July and the other ones, the other two come into effect at the end of November next year, so it's a long way off. Well, the first two, uh, one of them is altitude. In the UK, I was quite surprised actually, the UK has been pretty lenient in terms of its regulations. They have this drone code thing which says you shouldn't fly over 400 feet, shouldn't fly close to airports, but it hasn't been enshrined in regulation. It's, it's advisory, advisory, which says you shouldn't do these things, but there's actually been no specific regulation to prohibit you from flying right up close to airports or flying above 400 feet. In fact, I believe that the FPV organization in the UK managed to get special dispensation from the CAA to fly up to 1,000 feet. But now the regulators come out, CAA has come out and said, we're going to put the kibosh on all this. You cannot fly within one kilometer of an airport and you must not fly over 400 feet. Now, I don't know if this 400 foot limit, so they've changed it from an advisory into a a regulation as of July 30th or 31st or whatever it is. I don't know if that's going to affect the thousand foot limit that FPV flyers have been granted. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Haven't seen any solid evidence, but if you know, please make a comment in the comment section on this video so that other people will know, if you know for sure. So anyway, that means basically you now have rules or you will now have rules as of, what is it, um, August, which control how high you can fly and how close you can come to an airport. These are pretty common sense rules. I'm, you know, I don't think anyone will be too upset. In fact, most people around the world will be going, gosh, I wish our rules were that good, because um, the vertical separation thing is, is pretty good. Basically, the whole idea of having a 400 foot ceiling for unmanned aircraft is to keep them out of the airspace used by manned aircraft. Now, we've got Cessnas and Microlites and all sorts of aircraft flying up there at 500 feet and above. And generally speaking, in most countries, they are regulated. They have to stay above 500 feet unless they're taking off and landing or operating in a designated low-flying area. So generally, if you stay below 400, you're going to be safe with your drone or your model. The only exception to this, of course, is an airport or a heliport, because most of the time these full-size aircraft or manned aircraft have to stay above 500 feet. But if you want to land or take off, you've got to go below 500 feet. There's no point in landing at 500 feet, because when you open the door to get out, you will fall to your death. It is a ridiculous idea to land at 500 feet. So you have to come down to ground level to land. Same goes for taking off. There is no point in taking off at 500 feet because you'll never get the passengers up there. You can't have a ladder long enough. So when manned aircraft need to take off and land, you need to have an airport. And obviously this separation, the vertical separation disappears because aircraft are coming down below 400 feet. So you need to put an exclusion zone around those places where aircraft and helicopters take off and land. Every other country in the world has done it by way of regulation, except perhaps the USA. I think it's still advisory in the USA. I think you can fly close to an airport so long as you get permission of the control tower. So they'll probably change that rule anyway. Uh, but every other country like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the, everyone else has said basically, you can't fly within this much of an airport. And I find this interesting that the UK has chosen one kilometer as that exclusion radius from the perimeter, perimeter of an airport because it's a really, really small number. One kilometer, a thousand meters. Roughly, what's that, about 1,600, well, not a thousand meters must be th about three times, about 3,300 feet from the edge of an airport, including an international airport. That sounds like a really small amount. I could easily imagine a 747 on approach to Heathrow coming in at some stages well below 400 feet, more than one kilometer out from the threshold. 
maybe they don't, but I, I, could, I could imagine that. So I would have thought they would have made it a bigger number. As I say, 4K in New Zealand, 5K in Canada, 5K in Australia. Um, I don't know what it is in a few other countries, but originally in Canada it was going to be 9K, I think it was. So you need to provide that exclusion zone. I don't think the UK one's big enough. So if you live in the UK, woohoo, good for you. You've got away with, uh, got off very lightly in terms of that exclusion zone. Because I know that when they put the 9K limit in Canada, basically huge swathes of populated areas were no-fly zones. Because all the little circles around airports overlapped and there was no spaces in between for people to fly their drones or their model aircraft. It was stupid, it was lunacy. Fortunately, Canada saw the folly in this and they backed down to five, I think it's five kilometres. And that's a more reasonable amount. In Australia, they're even smarter in Australia because they have a five kilometre exclusion around controlled airfields. And controlled airfields means you've got a tower, which means it's probably pretty busy. There's probably passenger aircraft coming and going, you know, 747s and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of air traffic. So you need to have a bigger exclusion zone around there because bigger planes tend to come in on a shallower glide path or approach path and so forth. So yeah, it makes more sense where there's lots of air traffic, have a bigger zero area. But in Australia, if it's an uncontrolled airfield, which might be just a little rural airfield like the one here in Taikara, you can fly pretty much right up to the edge of it, as long as you're on the sides, because the rule is, if an aeroplane comes along, you've got to land. Oh, common sense, strikes, Kaza, thank you. I mean, that's all you need to do. If you are flying near an airport, an uncontrolled airport, and an aeroplane comes along, if you land, you do not pose a threat to that aircraft. So, problem solved. Yes, uh, but no other regulators haven't been quite smart enough to work that out. And here in New Zealand, oh, we've got the worst of all worlds. We have the same exclusion zone around our international airport, four kilometres, as we do around a tiny little rural provincial airport like this one, also four kilometres, and even around helipads, four kilometres. Whereas at least in Australia and Canada, they've realised, well, helicopters don't sort of come in long and low, they come in far more steeply. So we're going to just require a 1.8 kilometre radius around a helipad in New Zealand, four kilometres, the same as our international airport. So we've got a little helipad in town here for the hospital. And it's used maybe once a week or a couple of times a month. And the, the exclusion zone around that is exactly the same as the exclusion zone around Auckland International Airport, which has, you know, scores of movements of probably, you know, 100 movements a day. It's stupid, it's silly, but that's the way. CAA have taken the easy route. They haven't analysed the risk. They haven't looked at what's involved. They've just said, ah, can't be bothered. Pass me the biscuits and the coffee. Let's just make it 4K. And that's a bit unfair on those of us who would like to be able to fly within that area quite safely and do fly within that area quite safely. But, so the UK, you've got off really lightly with your one kilometre. Now, as I said, the other thing is you're limited to 400 feet now, so get used to that. It's not a big deal. The only time I find I'd ever like to fly above 400 feet is when I'm flying a thermal soar, if I'm flying a, a glider, which, you know, some to get the best of thermals, you need to go up with them, and sometimes you can go up really high. If you're going to have to stay below 400 feet, you can't have a lot of fun thermal soaring, even with the DLG, because you're, you're constantly having to bail out of a thermal because you're getting too high, and then find another one before you land. So I'm sure model aircraft will have some dispensation. I don't know. I, I've heard that the CIA in the UK are going to differentiate between drones and model aircraft. And possibly the way they'll do that is not so much by the craft, but where it's flown. I would suspect that if you fly at an approved, what is it, BMFA, um, strip, then you'll be flying a model aircraft. But if you flew the same craft away from a designated model flying area, it'll be a drone and a different set of rules will apply. So I'm not sure what's happening, but I assume that's going to happen. It's probably the only way they can really, well, the easy way for them to draw a distinction because they're not that bright. And working out that drones have GPS and have an autonomous capability, whereas model aircraft are flown, you know, manually, it's just too hard for them. It's too hard. They can't do that. You know, it's, um, there's not enough coffee in the world for them to come to that conclusion. Right, now the other two rules, which are, well, I don't see the point myself, but in the UK, two more rules coming in on, by the, on the 30th of November 2019. The first one is drone operator registration. Just like in America, just like they're planning in Australia, just like they're planning in Canada. You, if you fly a model or a drone that weighs more than 250 grams, you will have to register with the CAA. And I think everyone who regularly watches my videos knows that I'm not a fan of registration. It serves no purpose other than to tick boxes and make people feel important and to, to placate the politicians who don't understand the problem but want you to do something. So CAA can go, we've solved this problem. We're now registering all the drone operators and therefore they will not break the rules. Nothing will go wrong. And if something does happen, we'll be able to track them down and find them or imprison them. Because actually, worth mentioning, there are some pretty stiff fines associated with breaching these regulations. One of them, I think, is unlimited fine. 
uh, I forget which rule it is. I'll put something in the description. I'll put a link to the more information. But if you break one of these new rules, you can have an unlimited fine and in prison and a prison term. Seriously, we're playing with toys, and you can be fined an unlimited amount. I mean, if you if you cheat on your taxes or you steal from you know break in and steal a, you know rob a bank, you can't be fined an unlimited amount. This makes it one of the worst crimes. Child molesters are not fined an unlimited amount, but if you fly your toy in the wrong place or break the rules, you could be fined an unlimited amount. Shows you how out of whack, how the regulators and the politicians just do not understand the, the risk, the level of risk, which is much lower than they keep telling us. So those are the penalties you'll have to watch out for, but you will have to register. If you fly a craft that weighs more than 250 grams, you will have to register, and I dare say you'll have to put your number on the drone and everything, so that when, if you do something wrong, they can catch the drone and, and tra track you down. But honestly, these things, are uh, databases like this are rife for misuse. They're primed for misuse. Imagine that you are um, on this drone database, and somebody rings up the police and complains, oh look, there's a drone flying over my backyard and he's spying on me and my daughter, we're, we're sunbathing nude in the backyard and it's not very good. The police will come, they'll get the database, they'll find everyone that has a drone in that area who's registered and they'll go and knock on your door. Oi, what are you doing? We're going to prove you didn't fly your drone over this woman and her daughter naked sunbathing in the backyard. Prove you're not a pervert, we'll put you in jail, we'll fine you an unlimited amount. That's not good enough. It, it, and nowhere in the world has a registration database been effective in either preventing people from doing bad things or tracking down people who do do bad things. The thing is that if you are going to be a bad actor, if you're going to get up to mischief with your drone, you're not going to register, are you? I mean, seriously, if you are one of these people, and of course the media is full of these stories, drones are used to drop contraband into prisons. If you are going to use a drone for that purpose, you are not going to go down to the local high street store and buy a drone and register it and then use that drone to fly contraband into a prison because you know that if the drone if, you, if the drone gets captured they're going to find you and they're going to put you in jail and fine you an unlimited amount. No, you will steal a drone and you'll use that and then if you're the legal owner of that drone you're the one that's going to be on the database you're going to have people police knocking on your door saying prove you didn't drop contraband into this prison. It's rife for abuse. It's ridiculous. It's crazy lunatic stuff. It just means that boxes can be ticked and people can feel good that they're doing something even if it's completely ineffective they're doing something. That's not the way good regulation is made. Now, the second aspect is compulsory online um, competency tests. You'll, be have, you'll have to sit a little test online. And it, these things are, again, I don't, in some way I see it, there's a, there's a value to it, but it's nowhere near as valuable as the politicians and regulators might think. You're going to have to sit down in front of your computer and fill out a, multi, you know, fill out a questionnaire and get the answers right, and then you get basically approved and you get your registration. But all that does is it proves that the right numbers were typed into the boxes on the form on the computer. It doesn't even mean it was you. You could have your, your much cleverer sister filling it in. Or you could just be copying from a website that has all the details. You may not learn a damn thing. It may say, what is the maximum altitude you can fly your drone at? And you'll go, mm, oh, oh, 400. Type in 400, and you haven't learned it. If someone asks you tomorrow, you might can't remember. Oh, I don't know what it was. I just filled in the form. It doesn't guarantee learning. These online competency tests do not guarantee anything other than somebody has plugged the right numbers into the form. That's not a guarantee of anything. And even more so, even if someone does sit down and learn this stuff and do the exam properly and, you know, not cheat, then a year or two down the road, will they remember? Well, here's a question I want you to honestly try and answer. If you've got a driver's license, you will have sat a theory test and a practical test to get that license. If you got that license more than two or three years ago, I would challenge you to go back and sit the theory test again and get 100%. I would almost certainly guarantee that the vast majority of people would not be able to get 100% in that theory test because people forget stuff. I mean, how close can you park to a corner? Um, even I can't remember that, and I, you know, I don't know what that is. Um, and that may have changed over the years. And also, um, Rules change, rules change. So you, what you learn today may not be relevant tomorrow, but the exam you set only proves you knew it at the time. It's a snapshot in your competency. It doesn't guarantee ongoing competency. So I think it is a good thing because it means people will at least be roughly familiar with the rules, but the regulators and the politicians cannot rely on it to ensure that drone flyers are always aware of the rules and their obligations under them. So yeah, these registration and competency, yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced. I'm also rather disappointed that the regulators seem to be laying all the blame on drone flies. Whenever there's anything, you know, in the media, drone um, seen from aircraft, it's always implied that the drone flyer is at fault. And reality is somewhat different. Um, 
There was an incident in the UK just published this week where a the police, the police, you know, the boys in blue, they were all out there with their little bobby hats on and their sidearms and their fluoro jackets and their clipboards and all their spotters and everything done by the book, absolutely done by the book. You know, I mean, it's the police, they're spending your money. They're, money is no object. So they were flying a drone, 300 feet above the ground, no problems. You think, great, it's within the advisory, advised maximum altitude of 400 feet that the CIA has been talking about. And they were flying this drone there. And then all of a sudden, they all pooed their pants. Yes, little poos come out their pants, every one of them. Why? Because an F-15 military fighter jet came screaming through at 500 feet, doing 520 miles an hour. Woo, now, excuse me, um, no wonder they pooed their pants. You, well, they've got spotters there, but when an aircraft's approaching at just 500 feet above ground level, at 520 miles an hour, you cannot see that thing until it's upon you. You won't hear it until it's upon you. And by the, you don't have time to turn to the pilot and say, excuse me, but there is a F-15 fighter jet coming. Uh, by the time you got halfway through that sentence, it would have been five miles the other way. So it's only natural that people um, en engaged in bouts of excrement when this happens. Suddenly, boom, what's going on? Um, no, no one was hurt. No property was damaged because the fighter jet was at 500 feet. The drone was at 300 feet. It, Everyone was operating within the regulations. So there was a 200 foot gap. Hey, fantastic. An inch is as good as a mile. And if people follow the rules or use common sense, that works. So, but the media reported it as, oh, it was so dangerous. You know, the plane could have been hit this drone and people could have died. No, I mean, if you're at an airport, a good example is you fly into an international airport, right? You look out the window. How many planes do you see? You see dozens of planes everywhere. They're not all reported as incidents. Oh, we saw a plane from our plane. No, because they're operating by a set of rules which ensures that there's separation. Now, the drone and the F-15 were operating under a set of rules that ensured separation. It's all good. It wasn't an incident. How could it be an incident? Because it was within the parameters prescribed by the rules. So why is it being reported as an incident? I don't know. It's crazy but that's the thing of course the drone you know if it wasn't the police if the police were not flying that drone you could bet that whoever was flying it would have been vilified even if they were taking all the same measures but the police have a special get out of jail free card that they can use in these cases and people oh the police they wouldn't do anything wrong oh no of course they wouldn't that's what's happened there so yeah, you know that's that <laughs> what do you do and if you want further proof that it's not always the drone operators causing the problems CAA in New Zealand publish a Every two months they publish a magazine called Vector. It's an aviation safety magazine. It's available down to download off the internet. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. Go down and click on that. You'll download it. It's a PDF. So it's really interesting. There's an article in there written by someone who flies drones commercially. And I think they're also a pilot. But it um, outlines some of the issues they've had with manned aircraft breaking the rules, breaking the regulations. Uh, they're operating completely legitimately. And they have to, seems like quite regularly, take into account the fact that Manned aviation is not going to follow the rules laid down for them. Yet, yet every time we see a drone incident reported, it's always the fault of the drone operator. Ah, oh, no, no, no. The regulators have to start putting a lot more pressure on manned aviation. And in fact, this, in this Vector magazine, good thumbs up to CAA New Zealand for making that point. They, they're making the point that it's up to manned aviation to also take responsibility of the situation and abide by the rules that are laid down for them. So, yeah, but the other thing is there is quarterly incident reports published by CAA here in New Zealand. Now previously they were kind of a mishmash, everything was all clumped up together, it was kind of hard to read. This quarter they have changed the format, they've separated stuff out and they've got a separate category for RPAS incidents. Now when we read in the paper that the number of incidents involving drones has, has blown out by 260% or something, I saw that headline in the UK somewhere, um, you know things obviously these drones are getting out of control, well no I, I urge you to go to that I'll put a link in the description, go to that quarterly incident report here in New Zealand and look at what those drone incidents were. Um, I don't know how they can consider them a drone incident when the pilot says something like, I saw something out the window, it could have been a seagull, it could have been a weather balloon, maybe it was a drone. I mean, no, that's not a drone incident report, that is a, an unidentified object report. Previously it would have been categorised as an unidentified object, but now, no, the default definition is a drone report, RPAS, it's a remotely piloted aircraft system, must have been a drone. And there's so many of those reports in this incident list that obviously it could have been anything but they've decided to put it as an RPAS. No, not good enough. If you're going to call it an RPAS, you must be able to prove it's an RPAS. I mean, you don't, 
really there's a burden, there's a threshold that has to be met before you can consider something to be an incident with an RPAS or a drone. And that's not being met in the civil aviation reporting figures. They need to have a category for unidentified object. And this is absolutely certainly identified as a drone, it's an unidentified object. There was one instance where it was definitely a drone, apparently someone was in a paraglider and a drone flew into their cables and tangled them. Well, yeah, that's, if you've got the drone hanging there in front of you on, your, on your cables, that's definitely a drone, so that counts. But when a pilot says, oh, I saw something out the window, and it might have been a drone, that's not, no, the threshold is not met, it's not good enough. Now we have an aircraft circling overhead that'll come and ruin my, my videoing. Um, but there you go, that's basically a wrap up for today. As I say, links in the description, please go and look at them. And I'm trying to produce content here that educates people. A lot of people have said, hey, I learned stuff on your rant videos that I didn't know about anywhere else. So please take the time to tell other people about these videos and hopefully they'll subscribe and I'll get more subscribers and that'll be great. But um, yeah, spread the word because this is educational as much as it is um, ranty. And if you've got any heads ups you'd like to send me, please do. People sent me heads up on that, that uh, drone incident in Dev in the UK with the police thing. I'd already seen it, but um, I thank the people that sent me the heads up on that one. And I'll do my best to keep everyone informed. These videos will be irregular in terms of how I publish them because it just depends on what's happened. I did one today because we had the, the UK announce all these changes and who knows when the next one will be. What the hell is that? It's a Diamond DA40. It's a twin star. Diesel engines. Um, noisy as hell. But never mind. I'll be finished soon. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you for watching. Comments, questions in the usual place. Thumbs up if you like the video. Thumbs down if you don't. And if you don't care, I don't care. Stay tuned. There's lots more stuff coming. I'll load the truck up. Moving to Beverly Hills. No, I'm not. You'll see what's happening with the truck. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. Bye for now. G'day and welcome back. I'm in the outside ranty chair today. To... Oh. Good, mate. I'm already fully invested in Bitcoin. Yeah. I'm up. I'm, I'm, I'm just basically stocking up, I'm, I'm um, investing, I've fully invested, all my capital is tied up in Bitcoin now. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm all set, I, I know everything I need to know. No worries mate, do you want to buy some? The party you are calling is not receiving calls at this time.